The church in the book of Ephesians is described as the bride of Christ. And I want you to see the beauty of the bride of Christ and how much He loves and cherishes her today. We're going to talk about how Jesus has His relationship with the church from the book of Ephesians. Stay tuned as we talk about it in just a moment. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. And now, Josh McCrary, the gospel is gold. A policeman pulls a man over for weaving in and out of traffic, and the policeman told the guy, he said, Sir, you need to breathe in this breathalyzer tube. The man told the police officer, he says, Sir, I'm sorry, I cannot breathe into that breathalyzer tube because I have asthma and I may have an asthma attack. The policeman said, All right. You need to come down to the station with me and we're going to take a blood sample. The man told the policeman, he said, Sir, I cannot give you blood because I'm a hemophiliac and I might bleed everywhere. The policeman said, All right, fine. You're going to have to walk this straight line. The man told the cop, he said, Sir, I'm sorry, I can't walk any straight lines because I've had way too much to drink to be walking any straight lines. <laughs> I think he just told on himself. But you know, I want you to think about straight lines just for a minute. You know, the Bible says that straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Straight ways, difficult ways, are usually the best ways. Somebody said the, past, the path of least resistance leads to the path of least results. Oh, that's so true. You know, you think about the church for a minute. The church in the Bible literally is a straight line to God's glory. In fact, I, I think about in Ephesians chapter 3, at the very end of the chapter, when he, he specifically said, Unto Him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ without all, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The church was always in the mind of God. It's a beautiful thing. And I want to talk to you about the wonder and the glory of God's church, the bride of Christ. You know, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the Bible says to the Ephesian elders, Paul is speaking, and he said, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, notice, which he purchased with his own blood. And people today on the radio, these preachers, they'll say, Oh, you don't need to be a member of any church to go to heaven. It's just a sign that points to heaven. But Jesus purchased the church with His blood, Acts 20, 28. Could you look Jesus in the face today? If you were standing at the foot of the cross, could you look at Jesus and say, Your church is not important? It's just a sign that points to heaven, right? Well, no. The church is the straight line right into the glory of God. That's what I want you to see today. The importance of being in the right church. The one that Jesus built. The one that He bought. And the one that He betrothed to be His wife. You know, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10... The Bible describes the church as the eternal purpose of God. Now notice, the language is difficult, but you have to stay with me just for a minute. He's talking about this mystery that has been revealed to the Gentiles, the church. And he said, To the intent that now the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what he's saying is, it was always God's plan that God would build the church and that He would purchase it with the blood of Christ. Friend, that is a beautiful thought. That if you're a member of the church of the Bible, you have always been in the mind of God because of that. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, you just moved down there in the chapter, and he said, Now unto him that is able to do above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. 
That's where God's glory is found. And that's where we give Him glory. You know, in my truck today, the air conditioner is broken. And I can imagine that it's probably something pretty easy to fix, maybe a switch or a fan relay. But I keep putting it off, you know. I think, well, we're going to go to the lake this weekend. I need to pull my boat down to the lake. So I think, well, I can't put, put it in the shop right now. And then the next week comes around, I think, well, I know I need to take it and go get it fixed, but I've got this, this, and this I need to do. I need to have my truck, so I just keep putting it off. So I've been driving around this summer with the windows down, sweating, <laughs> you know, with no air conditioner. It's burning up hot outside. And I think to myself, I know I need to get this fixed. But what if I were to get in the truck and it wouldn't start? Maybe, maybe the alternator is bad, so now the battery has gone down and I have a dead battery and a bad alternator. Do you think I would be able to put that off? Well, no. <laughs> How many times do people treat their salvation like a bad air conditioner? If it were the starter... Or if it were the alternator that were bad, you would have to fix it immediately. And that's what we want to think about today. If I am not in a saved condition in the body of Christ where His blood is found, then I need to get there today. I don't need to put it off anymore. I want you to know, friend, it would be much better for you to battle your sins in the blood of Christ than to try to battle them on your own outside of Christ. And too many times people say, well, I'm not good enough to be saved. You know, I'm not ready to be saved because I'm just not good enough of a person to be a Christian. Friend, you've got to start somewhere. <laughs> God doesn't expect you to be perfect before you're a Christian. No, He expects you to wash your sins away and then you start gradually changing and fixing all those things. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30, the Bible says, He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. I want you to focus on that statement. He that is not with me is against me. So I've got to ask you, just like what we're going to study today from the book of Ephesians, are you with Jesus? Are you with Him in His church? What we're going to do from the book of Ephesians is notice one thing from each chapter where this question is asked. First, are you with me in the body? Are you with me in the building? Are you with me in the bride? Are you with me in the battle? These four things are found right here in the book of Ephesians, and all of them begin with the letter B. And, and it's almost like this book is written, and it's asking this question, are you with me? That's the, going to be the title of our lesson. Number one, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 and look at this question. Are you with me in the body? There was a preacher who came to the farmer and uh, he said, uh, Excuse me, sir, are you in the Lord's vineyard? The farmer said, uh, No, these are soybeans. The man asked the farmer, he said, Are you a Christian? The man said, no, I'm uh, Mr. Jones. Well, the guy asked the farmer, he said, uh, look, are you prepared for the resurrection? The farmer said, well, when is it? The preacher told him, he said, today, tomorrow, the next day. The farmer looked at the preacher and said, well, look, don't tell my wife about it because she's going to want to be there all three days. He didn't want to see it. It's so clear, you know. The preacher's trying to ask him, look, are you right with God or are you not? And the man kept trying to put it off. Friend, when, when God is asking you this question, are you with me in the body? I don't want you to put it off. You know, I don't want you to think, well, yeah, I've been baptized into a denomination, therefore I'm in the body of Christ. Well, wait a minute. 
Let's be careful. Let's look at this how God is seeing this, all right? Because God's plan from the foundation of the world, His eternal purpose was to purchase the, blood of, the church with the blood of Christ. There's a specific church that Jesus built in Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Which one is it? This book will tell us. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, if you're there in the book of Ephesians, let's ask the question, are you with me in the body? And in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, he begins and he writes, He hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. See, Jesus is the head and the church is the body. But it's interesting to me how many people in the world think that Jesus is the head and there are multiple bodies. Well, you and I both know that that would be sort of strange, <laughs> you know? We see these documentaries about maybe uh, someone who was born and they have one head but two bodies and we say, well, that is just the strangest thing. How did that happen? And many people think that the church has mutated into something like that. But God will say, how did that happen? That's not right. You see, Jesus is the head, and we are His body. He continues in Ephesians chapter 4, you look there in verse 3, He says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I love this passage about unity because He tells us what unity is. He uses the most exclusive number in any language to describe this unity. He said, there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, and one Lord and one faith and one baptism, one God and Father of all who's above all, through all, and in you all. The very first statement that he uses to describe the unity, he said, there is only one body. That means there is only one church. We just read in Ephesians 1, 22 that the, the church is His body. In Ephesians 4, it said there is one body, so that means the church and the body are the same. And He said there's only one. Friend, I've got to ask you today, will you open your heart and see just the plain truth that God's church is so clear and the denominational world is so confusing. They all teach a different way to get to heaven. This denomination believes something different than this denomination or this one. And why can't we just go straight back to the Bible and say, you know what, I'm just going to be the church of the New Testament. I'm going to be in the body of Christ. In Ephesians 5, look there if you will, if you're in the book of Ephesians, look there in uh, chapter 5 and verse 23. He said, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ also is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So, so he's asking us the question, are you with me? Are you with me in the body? Because if you're not, you see, Christ is the Savior of the body. And a man outside the body has not contacted the blood of Christ. It's God's eternal purpose. He purchased the church with His blood. Therefore, that is where we have to be. It's interesting in the open of this book, in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Notice, in Christ. Do you know what that means? He's talking about the church. When I am in Christ, I'm in the body of Christ, I'm in the church, that's where all spiritual blessings are. But if I'm outside of it, I can't have any spiritual blessings. You know, most of the people in the religious world, they do not believe or do not know what the Bible teaches on this issue. How important are we seeing the body of Christ is in our study today. 
In Ephesians 5 and verse 28, he said, So ought men to love their wives, even as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it, notice, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You see, he said that Jesus cherishes, he nourishes and cherishes the church. There was a preacher, a preacher who asked a man, he said, Can you hear those church bells ringing? And the man said, What? The preacher asked him again, he said, Can you hear the church bells ringing? The man said, What? And the preacher, you know, he's trying to get the guy to go to church, and he said, he asked him one more time, Can you hear those church bells ringing? The man answered, he said, I can't hear you. The church bells are ringing. Today, how many times do people neglect the church bells? But when, you know, that is the only place that you can contact the blood of Christ. The Bible specifically said Christ is the Savior of the body. The Bible says that He purchased the church with His blood. And I, I pray that you'll open your eyes, open your heart today. It's so clear. God wants to save you with the blood of Christ, but the only way that you can contact that blood is in His body, the church. So, number one, it's almost as if this book is asking us, are you with me in the body? Let's move on to chapter 2. Are you with me in the building? The church is not a building, but it's like a building. The church is the people. But he likens it into a building here in chapter 2. And I'm reminded of a church they met together and they said, we decided we're going to build a new building. They said, we're going to build a new church building. The building will be built on the site of the old one. The material in the old building will be used for the new one. Number four, we will continue to use the old building until the new one is completed. <laughs> well, that's impossible. You can't do that. <laughs> if you're going to use the old materials and the same site, you can't continue to use it. You know what you have to do? You've got to tear it down. Too many times people do not tear down before they begin to build. I'm reminded of Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 9. He said, The Lord put forth His hand and He touched my mouth. And He said, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I have set, this, set thee this day over the nations, over the kingdoms, notice, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to build and to plant. So before you can build and plant, what has to happen? <laughs> You've got to tear some things down. You know, it's kind of like what Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You know what Jesus said? You've got to empty yourself. Before you can start building, you've got to empty yourself. I remember that Jesus said, which of you intending to build a tower sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest after he began to build, they began to walk by. They mock him because they say he began to build and was not able to finish. <laughs> Church is likened to a building, but you've got to think, all right, am I going to count the cost and be ready to build this life? Look there in Ephesians chapter 2 how he describes this building. He said, you are no more strangers and foreigners. I love that thought. The Gentiles are no longer outcasts anymore, but in the body of Christ, he said, you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God household that says a building right and you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone and all the building fitly framed together it groweth up a holy temple in the Lord in whom also you are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit so I've got to ask you today what part of that building are you Jesus is a cornerstone. He's the main part of that building. 
but what part are you? Could you picture that you forced your family to live on the street because you would not provide for them a place to live? Friend, I want to tell you today, many families are being forced to live outside of Christ because the leaders of that home have not assumed their responsibilities in being spiritually safe in God's house, the church. I want to move on to number three. Not only have we talked about the, this wonderful uh, uh, body, the building, but I love this. The church is like the bride. There was a boy who came home and he told his father, he said, Dad, I got a part in the play. He tried out for a play at school. And Dad was excited, you know. He said, well, that's great, son. What part did you get? Tell me a little bit about it. Well, the little boy said, uh, well, I, I play a man in, in this play. I'm playing a man who is married. And Dad looked at him and he said, uh-oh. Pretty soon they're going to give you a speaking part. <laughs> well, just because a man is married doesn't mean he doesn't have a say. In fact, God said that the bride is submissive to the husband, just as the church is subject unto Christ. I love this illustration here in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 24. You remember in verse 23, he said that Christ is the Savior of the body, but he continues in verse 24, he said, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So the church is accountable to, to Christ as its head. You know, the head moves the entire body. The same is true with the church. So you talk about the power of this. Notice the price of it in verse 25. Ephesians 5, 25, he said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And notice, and gave himself for it. He gave himself for that church. That makes it very valuable. But notice the presentation. You look at verse 26 and 27. He said that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The reason why I love this book and I love this chapter so much is because it really shows the true value of the church that Jesus built. Many people in the religious world, they, they do not understand the value of the church that Jesus purchased with His blood. So We saw the power. We saw that it was purchased. And we saw that it will be presented on the day of judgment. So if I want to be saved, that's where I've got to be. Are you with me? It's the question that is being asked. And it's almost like this book is asking us, are you with me in the body? Are you with me in the building? Are you with me in the bride? Number four, are you with me in the battle? I believe this writer of the book of Ephesians, that's, that's sort of the idea that he has in mind. Are you fighting the spiritual battle that God wants you to fight? You know, the, the church is not a showboat. It's a battleship. You read about this in Ephesians chapter 6. But I want you to think about this battle just for a moment. There was a grandson and a, a granddaughter, and they were picking on their grandfather. And uh, they said, Granddaddy, we, we want you to make a sound like a frog. Granddaddy, he just ignored them for a little while. And they kept on, you know, they said, Well, Granddaddy, well, we want you to make a sound like a frog. He said, Why do you keep asking me that? They said, Well, Granddaddy, Mommy told us when you croaked, we were going to Disney World. <laughs> well, I guess that made him feel real good, huh? I want you to think about this on a serious note. What if you say the church is not valuable? What if you say it doesn't matter what church you're a member of? 
What if you say the church is just a sign that points to heaven? Do you think that would hurt God's feelings? That, that would almost be like the granddaddy. You know how he felt. He said, oh, okay, well, when I die, you just go to Disney World then. I just don't matter. To say that the church does not matter is to say that the death of Christ does not matter. And I hope today that you'll open your heart and mind and that you'll see that this is a battle. It's something that we have really, really got to think seriously about. Are you fighting that battle today? There was a silversmith who was very good at working with silver. And he had a young apprentice, and the apprentice asked him, he, he said, look, I keep purifying the silver, but how do I know when it's ready? The older man, he told this young boy, he said, look, just because you purify it three times, it doesn't always mean it comes out clean. Here's what you have to do. When you can see your face in that silver, you know it's ready. That's when it's pure. And friend, God has purchased the church and, and opened His heart to allow you to be a part of it because God wants to keep changing you into the image of His Son. And He, he wants to see that image in you to get you ready for heaven. That's what the church does. It prepares you here for what will be there. And a man who's not in the church, friend, he is not in the body. He is not in the building. He is not in the bride. And he's certainly not in the battle. In Ephesians chapter 6, you'll look there in verse 10, he said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having an all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You've got to fight, friend. And the only way that you can fight the devil is being covered in the blood of Christ in the church. I want you to think about this word. C-H- Blank, blank, C-H. What is missing in the word church? The U and the R. Friend, you are. If you're not in the church, you know what's missing? You are. God needs you. He loves you. He wants to save you. But you've got to be willing to meet him on his terms. Remember, Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me. Matthew 12, 30. Are you with Jesus in the body? Are you with him in the building? Are you with him in the bride? Are you with him in the battle? I hope and pray you are. In Acts chapter 2, when the church began, the very first day the church had ever been established, they asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them what to do in verse 38. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In verse 41, they gladly received his word. They were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They were added by God. They didn't join. They were added when they obeyed the gospel correctly. In verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Will you, I am begging, will you be a member of that church? We love you. Thank you so much for viewing our broadcast. Until next time, God bless. Amen.